working on. I'm going to be uh, taking off uh, a bit where Oleg left and, uh, and try to zoom in on, um, on this inverse Euler equation that's become, at least for a little while, a bit the, the hallmark uh, of this literature. And I think, uh, it, yeah, everything good? I don't know. Yeah, OK. All right, but I, before I do that, I want to uh, replace this research program a bit in, uh, in a bit of a historical perspective. Uh, so the whole idea is that uh, the tax system can be used uh, to do redistribution and to do social insurance. And that's an idea that goes back, uh, I mean, more recently to Milton Friedman uh, in 1962, and he proposed something that uh, you're probably all familiar with, which is a negative income tax. So he said, we're just going to have a tax system that's going to rebate some money to, to poor people, and uh, rich people are going to have to contribute. One way to do that was to have a linear income tax uh, with a lump sum rebate. Uh, and that would be a, a good way to provide social insurance and to do, and to do a distribution. And Eitan is the, the one who first formalized this idea uh, in, a, in a Ristad paper in, a, in 1972. It's called the optimal, uh, the optimal Linear Income Tax. Okay. And then from there, uh, there's a, the, a more recent strand of the, the public finance literature really took off, uh, starting a bit with the, the contribution of Merleys. So he did a bit what Etan did, but allowing for nonlinear taxes. So maybe it's a good idea not to have just a linear income tax with lump sum rebate, but something more complicated. Actually, he solved under some special cases for the optimal nonlinear income tax. Okay? And then there's uh, this, this literature building on Etan's model and then uh, Merlis's model uh, has been uh, revived recently uh, and made a bit more applied and more empirical by Emmanuel Saez, for example, where he tried to really calibrate the Merleys model and come up with uh, uh, some serious normative prescriptions based on uh, empirical analysis of what optimal taxes should be. We know quite a bit uh, about that. It seems to be that uh, uh, income taxes are a good idea to redistribute and to provide social insurance. But uh, we know much less about the, role of, the potential role of other taxes in uh, supplementing income taxes to do redistribution or to provide social insurance. And in particular, uh, we know very little about the role of capital taxes uh, in these arrangements. Okay. And there was an early paper that seemed to provide a negative answer to the question, are capital taxes useful at all to provide social insurance and to redistribute? And that was a paper in 1976 by Atkinson and Stiglitz. Okay. So they had a model very much like the one that uh, Oleg described yesterday but where you know your type in advance. Okay, so there's no recurring uncertainty. There's no future uncertainty. And what they showed is that under some uh, assumptions uh, about preferences, namely that you needed enough separability between consumption and leisure, you got this result that uh, you would do all the redistribution with a nonlinear income tax and not use capital taxes at all. Optimal capital taxes would be equal to zero. Okay? But importantly, that was a model where all the uncertainty was known uh, at date zero. Okay. And if you want to think in particular both about redistribution and about social insurance, it's important to realize that that's really not the way uh, we face risk in life. Okay. Uh, and I'll try to talk a bit about some empirical evidence coming from labor economists in particular that tries to document the nature of the risk that we're facing. And it seems to be that uh, this risk really accumulates over time, at least for a substantial fraction of our lifetime. Okay. And if you want to think about income risk, for example, a better benchmark than permanent types is a geometric random walk. Okay. So there are some qualifications around that. It's not perfect, but it's a better benchmark if you want to think about it. And in a geometric random walk, it's something that has uncertainty that accumulates over time. So there is future uncertainty. So we cannot use Atkinson Stiglitz in that world. And in particular, what Oleg showed you yesterday is that in a world like this, 
uh, you don't, the normative prescription of at least and Stiglitz is overturned. So instead of having zero optimal capital taxes, you need capital taxes at the optimum. Okay? You know that because a feature of the optimum is this inverse Euler equation, which as long as there's consumption uncertainty is incompatible with the Euler equation. Okay? So you need to distort savings somehow. Actually, you can say a little more, and you can say in which direction the wedge is going. And you can go from that to optimal taxes, but that, that's not the topic here. So there's a presumption that you should use capital taxes. Uh, at least the inverse Euler equation gives you a rationale for positive capital taxes. Okay? And uh, more generally, in economics, we don't have that many rationales for capital taxes. We have, uh, quite a few normative theories that predict zero optimal capital taxes. So Atkinson Stiglitz, that I already mentioned, is one of them. In a different context, Chamlet is another one. Okay? So this is kind of interesting. Okay? It could be, really, uh, if we take it seriously, uh, the foundation for uh, the theory of optimal capital taxation. So what we want to do today is to try to take this seriously and, and to try to understand if there are big welfare gains that lie behind uh, this optimal prescription, okay? this prescription. In other words, suppose you're in a situation where you don't tax capital, okay? but you really should because uh, the optimum would feature uh, capital taxes. Are there big welfare gains from going from a zero capital tax to optimal capital taxes? Are there big welfare gains from introducing uh, optimal savings distortion? showed that you, you could achieve the optimum using income taxes alone, but there were other ways. Oh, for sure. Uh, right? you could ta that basically, you could use any good. Uh, no, 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 yeah, okay. Uh, so let me qualify. Uh, there are, uh, in their model, and in a lot of these models, in the model I'm going to present today, uh, income taxes and uh, uniform consumption taxes over time are equivalent. Right. Okay? So an equivalent way of... Um, they had another paper uh, where they called for uniform commodity taxation. Okay, so you should, talk, you should tax every commodity at the same rate. That means you do income taxation. If you were to, they have several papers. One of them is they do linear taxes. One of them they do nonlinear taxes. So if you, do, if you want to stick to the nonlinear model, then you would have to use nonlinear consumption taxes. But it would be important to tax the two consumption goods at the same rate so that you don't distort the savings distortions. You don't want to distort the margin uh, of consumption of one good versus the other good. Okay? So that's really the result. In general, in this literature, uh, it, the way it proceeds is to say, here's the environment, and we have some constraints on the environment. And we're going to solve for the optimal allocation using mechanism design. Okay? Once you have the optimal allocation, you can ask yourself a second set of questions, which is about implementation. So what kind of tools? would allow me to implement this allocation. The direct mechanism is one of them, but you could try to do something different. And you could try to use mechanisms that look a bit more like taxes. Okay? And so one of the way of implementing the optimum in Atkinson and Stiglitz is a nonlinear income tax. Another way is uh, nonlinear consumption taxes, but that makes sure that they tax the two goods at the same rate. What's important, and it's something you know not from the implementation theory, but from the characterization of the optimal allocation, is that you don't want to distort uh, the consumption of one good versus the other. In other words, you don't want to distort savings. The margin rate of substitution, the intertemporal rate of substitution, has to be the same as the marginal rate of transformation. Okay? So, uh, how would we try to uh, uh, approach, I, I gave it away a little bit, but how do we try to approach the question that we're asking? Okay, we're trying to quantify what uh, the welfare gains from optimal ta capital taxation are based on the inverse Euler equation. So the way you typically approach uh, those problems is you lay down an environment. And in this environment, for example, for the question at hand, uh, you would have individuals that would be ex ante identicals, or maybe there are something that differentiates them, that's uh, known ex ante. But then ex post, they're going to have different paths. Okay, that could reflect uh, a lot of different risks that we face in life. 
uh, some of these risks could originate in the labor market, some of them probably are more related to health, especially in the later stages of life. And in an environment like this, so you have people who are exactly identical and exposed different, it's tempting to say that you want to provide some insurance, okay? Uh, because that's going to reduce uh, the amount of uncertainty that individuals are facing. Of course, the downside is, th is that as you provide this insurance, uh, you affect incentives, okay? Yeah, the utility and the potential risk that they may be facing, but then exposed, you know, one of them gets a job and the other doesn't, for example. Yeah. Right, right, right. So the inverse Euler equation has nothing to do with heterogeneity and all to do with uncertainty. So it's really about social insurance and not about redistribution. Uh, and that's a bit why in Atkinson Stiglitz you don't have capital taxes. And when you go to a setting where you allow for you know, uh, recurring uncertainty, you get that. Okay, so it, it's important to, to realize it's really about uh, social insurance. So you would proceed like this, and then you would uh, try to say, well, let's try to resolve optimally this trade-off between uh, insurance and incentives, and, and study also how to best uh, uh, deliver those incentives. So how much incentives do we want to give, and how do we want to give those incentives? The problem, if you were to go that route for the question that we're asking here, is that you would solve at the same time uh, optimal savings and uh, labor effort or work distortion the same time uh, the income tax and the income tax and the capital income tax so conceptually it's not uh, super clean secondly and that's probably uh, the biggest problem this is uh, when you want to have a, an environment that's somehow realistic from an empirical perspective uh, it's impossible to solve this problem by that I mean that it's impossible to solve it on the computer okay uh, it's just uh, a problem that's too big and the problems really come from allowing for stochastic processes that look like a little bit uh, what we would like to model. And in particular, if you have stochastic processes that uh, have some persistence, and I told you, you know, we're shooting, for example, for a geometric random walk or something like that, and then it becomes very hard to uh, solve perfectly. Okay. One way to, uh, to go at this problem and something I can do tomorrow and is related to what Ilya was presenting is to try to uh, reduce that problem a little bit by using a first order approach, okay? And solve this relaxed problem, which is amenable to numerical simulation because it's a much uh, lower dimensionality of the state space, and then check whether the first order approach is valid or not, okay? But that will be in specific environments, and it's actually quite numerically intensive, okay? So for our point, it's a bit of a non-starter to do that, okay? Uh, so what we do in this paper is going to be a bit different. It's going to be to say, uh, in order uh, to, to, for conceptual reasons and also for practical reasons because we want to be able to solve it, uh, we're going to say, okay, let's take an allocation that's incentive compatible. So this allocation has some work effort, okay? And what we're going to try to do is to provide, to keep the labor allocation the same, but uh, to perturb the consumption allocation while preserving incentive compatibility and delivering the same utility, okay? So in other words, if you want to use the, the slightly loose language that I'm putting up here, there are two questions. How much incentives you want to provide and how you want to provide those incentives. How much incentives is what kind of labor allocation do you want? Okay, people are going to be more or less productive. How much do you want them to work depending on their productivity, really on their history of productivity and everything? Okay. If you want people with different histories of productivity to uh, actually produce differently so that it's incentive compatible, you need to uh, provide them with different consumption allocations. So you need to reward people who say that they're productive and, and first uh, have to work a lot. Okay. But uh, this doesn't tell you how you should spread this consumption over time. Okay. So there's still a margin there, and the inverse Euler equation has all to do with that. Okay. So you can provide the same amount of incentives, okay? Implement the same uh, uh, labor allocation in an incentive compatible way with different consumption allocations, okay? And one of them is gonna be the least costly one. It's gonna satisfy the inverse Euler equation. 
And there are many other ones, including one, for example, that satisfies the Euler equation. Okay. And then we can try to ask, well, what are the welfare gains from moving, for example, from the consumption allocation that satisfies the Euler equation to the consumption allocation that satisfies the inverse Euler equation? And all these allocations would implement the same labor allocation. Okay. So we're really zooming in on uh, the contribution of uh, savings distortion because we're freezing completely uh, the labor allocation. So conceptually, it's exactly what we want to do. And uh, from a practical perspective, that's a problem that we're going to be able to solve. Okay? So uh, uh, to solve in quite general environments uh, for very general stochastic processes in general equilibrium. And so we're going to be able to learn a little bit uh, not only quantitatively how big these welfare gains are, but qualitatively what they depend on. Okay. So we're going to build, uh, you can think of it as a little machine for quantitative analysis. And the input is going to be any baseline consumption allocation okay. that implements some kind of, uh, that's incentive compatible, so implements some kind of labor allocation. A labor allocation. And then uh, the output is going to be a new consumption allocation and some efficiency gain. But this consumption allocation is going to implement the same work effort, the same labor allocation. Okay? So in other words, you could be starting, for example, from uh, an equilibrium that represents current policy. Okay? Uh, so there are some taxes in there. Uh, there are some labor taxes. There are some capital taxes, but they, they might not be optimal. We get a consumption allocation from there and also a labor allocation. Well, we're going to be able to, and it's going to be incentive compatible by construction because we constructed it as, as an equilibrium. Okay. And then we're going to say, well, let's take this consumption allocation and try to perturb it to introduce the optimal amount of savings distortions but keeping the labor allocation the same. So we're going to be able to characterize exactly how we want to do that and what are the welfare gains uh, that come from optimally perturbing the original consumption allocation. You know, the welfare gains from introducing the optimal uh, savings distortion. So the, pertur the perturbations you're making are not necessarily small. Mm -mm. No, no, no they, they, are, they could be very large, actually. Okay. So uh, this is a paper that was written uh, several years ago, six years ago. <laughs> uh, but we, we recently uh, finished the, the whole process. Mm -hmm. Okay. And time, uh, the this, this literature on intertemporal uh, public economics or new dynamic public finance. Uh, was still very, very uh, theoretical. So part of the goal of this paper was really to try to push that theory a bit more uh, towards, uh, towards application. Okay. And uh, the contribution really built a simple uh, methodology that was going to allow us uh, to, uh, to understand optimal capital taxes. And we're going to be able to understand conceptually uh, the nature of the efficiency gains from, uh, from capital taxation. And in particular, you'll see I'll put the composition of these gains uh, and, and tell you uh, and, and be able to tell you uh, really what they depend on. And in particular, we're going to uncover the parameters that are really important in terms of making the, of, of shaping these efficiency gains. So the amount of risk in the economy, and that's intuitive, the amount of risk aversion, and the, perhaps surprisingly, the amount of returns to capital. So I'll show you that these things are really crucial for. Uh, the size of the efficiency gains from capital taxes and from the size and for the size uh, of uh, capital taxes. Okay. For the gains, uh, so you, uh, we'll try to use the best uh, empirical knowledge that we have to try to uh, narrow a bit the range of efficiency gains. You'll see that uh, given what we know, this range is still pretty large. Uh, so they range from very small to uh, moderate or moderately large. For kind of our preferred calibration, uh, you'll see that they're they're pretty moderate. Okay. So uh, so they, they, it seems to say that uh, um, there are indeed efficiency gains from using optimal capital. But 
are not uh, necessarily that large. But uh, we'll see exactly uh, what are the arguments uh, behind this. So I'm going to start with a, a little two-period model uh, with a linear technology to try to uh, lay down the arguments and introduce some intuition. Uh, that's a model that's very easy to solve uh, completely, you know, theoretically and numerically. So we wouldn't need our method to solve that particular uh, problem. Okay, so I'm really uh, introducing this for to introduce the general tools. Uh, but then we'll move to an environment where it wouldn't be possible to solve for the full optimum. And so our method really has bite. Okay. So it's a two-period model. Uh, so there's a continuum of uh, ex-ante identical agents. And they're going to consume at t equals 0 and 1. But they're going to work only at t equals 1. Okay, so I'm introducing only the minimal uh, necessary ingredients for the inverse Euler equation and, and for these things. I'm not trying to build a robust uh, environment. The preferences are like this. Uh, so separable intertemporally, and they're also separable between consumption and leisure. And uh, as you understood yesterday, uh, both of these separate uh, for the inverse Euler equation. Okay? I think if we have these separabilities uh, in practice, but uh, there's no super condition uh, if you move away from separability. So at least as a benchmark, uh, it's good to, to understand this case. Uh, and then you see that there's a, so that's the disutility of, li of labor. And there's a shock theta. And we're going to assume that this uh, shock theta lies on an interval. And the realizations are going to be independent across agents. And I'm going to make the single crossing uh, assumption. OK? So this part is. Remove it, no? It's not such a big room. As the lecture is being recorded. Ah, OK, so I won't. Oh, you have another one? Okay. <laughs> now it works? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So this really, uh, I said that. So that part is really like the Merlis model. And the only thing that we're introducing is, uh, is a consumption stage before the realization of this uncertainty. And uh, the realization of the shock is going to be private information to the agent. But importantly, they're going to learn it only at t equals 1. Okay? So there are going to be differences in productivity. But these differences are going to be privately learned and only at period 1, in period 1. So uh, we're going to use the revelation principle to try to, uh, do to uh, and study a direct mechanism. So uh, an allocation is going to be incentive compatible if it satisfies uh, these uh, familiar constraints, uh, which just says that truth-telling dominates uh, any other reporting strategy sigma. And uh, so that's for incentive compatibility. On the technology side, I'm going to make things very, very simple. So uh, in period one, uh, you produce uh, from labor with productivity w, and it's just a linear technology. And between uh, date 0 and date 1, there's 
a savings technology. So you can invest capital and you have a linear rate of uh, a linear technology with a rate of return Q minus one. Okay. So if I invest one unit in period zero, I get Q minus one units of consumption uh, in period one. So if I have an allocation, I can determine if it's incentive compatible or not. And I also can also compute the cost of this allocation. Okay. And the cost is just the net present value of uh, consumption minus uh, what's being produced. Okay. So it's the cost of the resource cost of the net present value resource cost of the allocation to a planner that has to uh, deliver this allocation. Okay. So now I'm going to introduce some notation. Uh, given a labor allocation and a level of utility, okay, so N1 specifies a, a, a labor effort for every possible realization of the shock theta. And V is just a number. Okay? It's the utility. So the set gamma of N1 and V is going to be the set of allocations such that uh, the labor allocation coincides with the original allocation. They deliver utility V. Okay, and they satisfy incentive compatibility. So it's a set, okay, uh, and uh, it's a set with many allocations. And this set has a particular structure that we're going to be able to describe now. An allocation, uh, if you take two allocations in this set, then they can be obtained one from the other using perturbations like this. So let's try to understand those perturbations. Take an allocation that's in the set. Increase utility in period zero by beta delta and reduce utility in period one across all possible realizations of theta by delta. Okay. So you can see right away that this is a perturbation that's going to preserve utility. Okay. Because I'm increasing utility in period zero by beta delta and lowering utility in period one across all nodes by delta. So uh, it preserves utility. And importantly, it also preserves incentive compatibility. Why? Because the differences that in utility that you get uh, between two different, uh, for two different reports are, exact, are completely preserved because we do of, of these utilities across all possible. So it's going to preserve uh, uh, this constraint, and it's also going to preserve this constraint. So it's clear that if I take an allocation in this set, OK? I can move uh, and I perturb it, I'm going to get another allocation in this set. And what this theorem says is uh, that the two are actually equivalent. Why is it equivalent? Because I impose it. It's the way I define this set. Okay. So this is the set of allocations that have the same labor allocation and deliver some utility V and are incentive compatible. I'm sorry? I'm not perturbing the labor allocation, so I stay in this set. So you, it's like when you do, you know, it's like in consumption theory. You can try to maximize utility subject to resources or minimize costs subject to delivering utility. It's just more convenient for me to work in the dual. Uh, and so that's what I'm doing here. So I'm minimizing cost subject to delivering utility. I could do it the other way around. Okay. So uh, we have two, uh, two concepts now. Uh, this set gamma, and then for a given allocation, the set of perturbations, the set of perturbed allocations that are obtainable from this allocation. Okay. And what this proposition is saying is that the two are actually equivalent. Okay. So in other words, there's just one equivalence class in this set. So if you take all the, all the consumption allocations that implement, that are incentive compatible given a labor allocation and deliver the same utility, they're all obtainable one from the other using these perturbations. That's the only thing you can do. Okay. So the only thing you can do is basically play with savings distortions, play with the intertemporal allocation of consumption. So I already uh, gave you the argument in one direction. So let me try to give you an argument in the other direction. So that's the first part, just saying that the perturbations preserve incentive compatibility and deliver the same utility. That part is very easy. The second part uh, uh, is going to, 
I mean, the way we're going to prove it using uh, this continuum of shocks is uh, using an envelope condition. So uh, using uh, some of the work that Ilya uh, has done. So we use, um, uh, well, we actually don't even need a single class. Uh, we use incentive compatibility. Uh, we represent incentive compatibility this way, okay, using an envelope condition. So this says that uh, if you have an incentive compatible allocation, then the difference in utilities in period one for two different reports, theta and theta tilde, okay, is related to uh, some object that you can compute directly from the labor allocation. So you don't have to pay too much attention to this. What's important is that the labor allocation requires, okay, any given a labor allocation, if it's going to be incentive compatible, is going to require some spreads in utilities between, uh, between two different types. It's just given. If you want to be incentive compatible, these spreads are given. What it doesn't tell you is the level of U1. Okay? So the spreads are given. U1 is given up to a constant. Let's call this constant delta. Okay? And then given that I have to deliver utility V, okay, if I have delta, I'm going to have U0 as well. So the only thing I can do is move delta around. Okay? And that describes the whole set. So you can see that I'm using the fact that we have a continuum of shocks here. Okay? Otherwise, uh, this set would be a, a little richer. Okay? So we could still do our perturbations if the shocks were discrete. Actually, in our numerical implications by construction, uh, shocks are going to be discrete. But I wouldn't have uh, this proposition anymore, this equivalent. Okay? Uh, and intuitively, what's happening is that you could have some, some slack in the ice. All right, so we understand now. The idea is we freeze this labor allocation, we have a level of utility, and the only thing we can, and, and if we have incentive compatibility, okay, we pin down the allocation up to parallel shifts. And the only question is gonna be what's the optimal parallel shift? What are the determinants of the optimal parallel shifts? What are the efficiency gains from having the optimal parallel shift? Okay. So in order to uh, get at this question, uh, let me uh, try to isolate uh, two allocations in this set. Uh, one of them I'm going to call free savings, and the other one is going to be the optimal one. Free savings is going to satisfy the, the Euler equation, and the optimal one is going to satisfy the inverse Euler equation. Actually, it's a little more complicated than this, so let me try to uh, go into free savings a little bit. So free savings... Uh, we're going to say that an allocation satisfies free savings if uh, sigma star and zero, sigma star is the truth-telling strategy and zero is just a number zero, are the solution of this maximization problem where uh, you try to maximize both over how much savings you do and over your reports. Okay? So you jointly maximize over some savings and some reports. So the idea is, uh, you know, uh, suppose that you start with the, the direct mechanisms, but consumption is unobservable, okay? So people would try to solve that problem, okay? They would be able to, uh, they would be able to save. So what you can say is that this allocation is going to satisfy incentive compatibility, okay, by construction, because sigma star maximizes this. And uh, it's going to satisfy the Euler equation also, because people can save optimal. You cannot generally go uh, the other direction. So it's not because you satisfy the Euler equation and you're incentive compatible that you satisfy free savings. Okay? And it's just because the, uh, this problem is not jointly concave. Okay? Uh, so going back to our set here. In this set, there's a unique allocation that satisfies the Euler equation. Okay? The only thing we can do is shift intertemporally the allocation of consumption. So there's a unique one that's going to satisfy the Euler equation. There's a unique one that's going to satisfy the inverse Euler equation. The one that satisfies the Euler equation may or may not satisfy free savings. If it doesn't, it means that there's no, alloca no consumption allocation that implements this labor allocation and this level of utility that satisfies free savings. Okay, so it's a restriction. Uh, it's like a feasibility set. Okay? This particular labor allocation and utility is not feasible with free savings. 
this is not something that we're going to be very much concerned with. We're going to verify uh, that, that it's not a problem for us, but I'm not going to dig uh, very deep uh, into that issue. Okay. Now, that was one allocation. There's one that satisfies uh, the Euler equation in this set. The other one I want to isolate is the one, uh, is the minimal cost allocation. Okay, so I have this set, and I can try to minimize cost over this set. And the optimal allocation is the one that minimizes cost. And as you can already anticipate from uh, what you saw yesterday, it's going to satisfy this inverse Euler equation. So it's the same as the Euler equation, but the difference is that marginal utility is now the harmonic average of marginal utility tomorrow instead of being the arithmetic average. Okay. And if you combine uh, this observation with Jensen's inequality, you know that if the inverse Euler equation holds, then the Euler equation has to be violated in a particular direction. Okay? And it has to be violated in the directions of people being savings constrained. Okay? In other words, they would have to be facing some kind of tax on capital uh, uh, in order uh, to accept uh, this allocation. Okay? So, uh, so savings distortions uh, are optimal, uh, and individuals are saving constrained. So a bit of history and, uh, and this inverse Euler equation it first appeared in a paper on disability insurance by Diamond and Murray in 77. Then it was derived and exploited more by Rogerson in a repeated moral hazard setting. I think that was in uh, 85. Uh, and then uh, Oleg and Mike and Narayana uh, took it again and made it uh, an important part of, of public. No, there's nothing missing. It's C prime. C prime is 1 over U prime. Yeah. Uh, so C is the inverse of U. So C prime is just 1 over U prime. It's, it's another way to write the inverse Euler equation. OK? All right. So just uh, summarizing, in this set, we have, a, say, a baseline allocation. Imagine that this one corresponds to current policy. It satisfies the Euler equation. And we have the minimal cost allocation that satisfies uh, the inverse Euler equation. And, and that means that there are efficiency gains from moving from there to there, from introducing uh, uh, optimal savings distortion. Why is our, uh, let me revisit a bit my introduction of why our methodology is useful and everything. So what we saw is that this set is simple in the sense that you can obtain the optimal allocation from the baseline allocation using a simple perturbation. Okay? In this two-period example, it doesn't have a great advantage. In the dynamic general equilibrium model that I'm moving towards, that's going to be a great advantage in terms of uh, analytical and numerical tractability. Second, observe that it has the advantage also of being very robust in the sense that I actually don't need to know the labor allocation in order to determine the efficiency gains from capital taxation. Because I'm preserved, I'm implementing the same labor allocation. So I can take the consumption allocation that I see in the world. Okay? I know it's incentive compatible for the given labor allocation there by construction. And then I can try to perturb it while implementing the same labor allocation. So in particular, I don't need to observe labor. I don't need to know the labor allocation. And I don't need to know the parameters of the V function. Okay, I don't need to know the uh, elasticity of labor supply, for example, which is a very contentious uh, parameter. Okay, so our, our, uh, our method and the efficiency gains and the optimal capital taxes that we're going to derive are not going to depend on details and the environment that are crucial for other dimensions of uh, social insurance. Okay, so that's also an advantage uh, for us. Oh, for sure. The inverse Euler equation from the beginning requires uh, separability. And as I said, I mean, the motivation for that is not that we think preferences are separable. But to be fair, if you were, uh, it's hard to make the case that they're non separable in an interesting direction also. So it's a good benchmark, uh, at least given what we know now. And it's also the benchmark where we can actually derive a clean condition and explore it. If you move away from that, you can get many different things. And it's interesting to go there, 
but it, it's uh, given what we know now, it would be hard to make the case for capital taxation based on, in, on these non-separability. So here we're trying to say, well, let's just move away from that, be a bit uh, agnostic, and study this benchmark, and, and try to understand those arguments. Okay, but there's no uh, theoretical or empirical presumption that the world is like this. That's right. Uh, but that assumes that you keep M1 the same. That's right. Uh, for all, it, it, isn't it possible, for all you know, that if you changed M1, there would be a huge sure. So there are two things here. And maybe I can, this graph would be useful. Uh, so let's focus on, uh, on this one. This one is, is about the domain. And so on. So for, uh, like we can go back there. So what are these two curves? So I'm plotting, imagine that here I have, uh, so it, it's on a one-dimensional axis, so it's a, an abstraction really. But imagine I have the labor allocation here. Okay? And I'm plotting the cost of the different allocations in the set gamma. Okay, so these are, uh, imagine in projected on this axis, all the labor allocations in the set gamma, uh, sorry, yeah, exactly. All the, uh, let me say it differently. Imagine that I'm indexing, uh, you, have, you fix the level of utility V, okay? And uh, I studied different labor allocations. For the, each different labor allocation, there's a set gamma. Now, in this set gamma, I've uh, singled out two allocations. Okay? One satisfies the Euler equation, and I'm representing uh, the cost of the corresponding allocation in this curve. And one satisfies the inverse Euler equation, I'm representing the cost of the corresponding allocation in this curve. Okay? So this curve is lower than this curve. Okay? And some version of the vertical distance between these two curves represents uh, the optimal gains from savings distortion. But it's hard to say which one exactly. Okay, how do you compute the distance between two curves? First, it depends on the point where you're going. And uh, second, you might want to go diagonal and things like that. So well, I can tell you what we do. What we do is we take an allocation and we compute the vertical distance between the two curves. Okay, and we can do it at every point. So you learn a lot about the gains from savings distortion. Now, what number, if you were to say, zoom away from this, and what's the, if, what's the welfare gains from capital taxation? If you were to, trying to answer that question at that level of generality, it's a bit ambiguous what the answer should be. One thing you might want to say is, oh, that's the gain from moving from there, the minimum of the cost uh, where I impose the Euler equation, to the minimum of the cost where I imposed, where I'm, I don't have any restriction on savings distortions. Okay, so it would be, this vertical distance here. And you can see our method, uh, in this case, is going to provide an upper bound and a lower bound for this cost. If I apply it over here, I'm going to get a lower bound. But if I apply it at different points, I'm going to be able to generate an upper bound. Okay. Now, it's a bit misleading to say that because if I really want to compute it here, then I need to know this point. And I told you that one of the reasons we go to this method is that we can't compute this point. Okay? But theoretically, you could apply it in many different places. Okay? And, 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 learn about, uh, and learn about capital taxation. So that gives you exactly what we know. That's right. That's true, that's true. And, and I think, I don't want to trivialize this point, I think it's very important. Actually, in the paper I'm gonna to present tomorrow, I'm gonna to be able to compute those two points, okay? So I'll be able to answer the more general question, okay? 
And the conclusion of the paper tomorrow is going to be reinforcing the conclusion of this paper in a more special environment, uh, one that we can solve. It's going to have, you see that this the environment that I'm going to be studying today is going to be much more general than the environment I'm going to be studying tomorrow. Okay? Uh, but the environment that I'm going to be studying tomorrow, I'm going to get a more precise answer. I'm going to be able to compute everything. Okay? And we're going to confirm the conclusion of, uh, of the paper today. But what's the, the general conclusion that's emerging from these two papers and also uh, Mike and Alex's papers uh, is a bit that um, it's having the right labor income taxes is very important. Having the right capital income taxes might be less important in terms of uh, the regime today. And I'll be able to, to qualify that uh, a lot, actually. Uh, OK? No, I think in Stiglitz, they studied a model where optimal capital taxes are zero. So by construction, there are no gains from capital taxation. We're studying an environment where there's a presumption that capital taxes are useful. Okay, actually, they're part of the optimum. What we're trying to say is, are there big welfare gains associated with this prescription, deviating from uh, zero capital taxes? And the answer that we're going to come up with is moderate. Okay. I also want to say that this is the answer for the efficiency gain. The optimal capital taxes are actually quite large. Okay. All right, so uh, let me now move to the environment, that's, uh, the environment that I'm interested in. Okay, and I'm going to apply the tools that we developed in the two-period model to this uh, more general environment. So uh, the model is going to be dynamic. There's going to be a continuum of agents, and they're going to have different types. So the types is going to be indexing the excentric heterogeneity. Okay? And there's going to be, uh, these types are going to be distributed according to a measured psi. For every individual, I'm going to be uh, um, describing its utility as follows. Okay, so VI is going to be the net present value of its utility, and the preferences have the same structure as in the two-period model. So you work and consume in every period now, uh, and uh, what's going to be differentiating um, those guys, it could be the utility V, uh, U, but more importantly, it's going to be uh, the stochastic process theta. So these structs theta are going to be lying on an interval. They're going to have a general distribution over time. Okay? It doesn't even have to be Markov. It could be uh, anything. Uh, and their realizations are going to be independent across agents. Otherwise, we would be running into the kind of problems that uh, Ilya talked about yesterday. Yeah? Um, you said most of the differences uh, lie in the level of savings. Um, so the productivity or how people is going to work. No, for sure. But the question is a bit what you do with this observation. So uh, either these bequests are accidental or they're not very elastic, and then you should just tax them away because there's no reason to tolerate this source uh, of inequality. Or you think that this would have some kind of incentive effects on the accumulation decisions of, or, or work decisions of previous generations. And then you need to have a, a theory of optimal estate taxation. Uh, we actually wrote that paper, uh, but it's not what I'm going to do today. And uh, in that world, uh, you have a modified version of the inverse Euler equation that holds. Uh, okay. Uh, but I, let me not go into that uh, today. But I think you're right. It's, uh, it's an important, an important fact. But uh, also, the focus today, uh, and as I was saying, the, the, the really the, what's important for the inverse Euler equation is not so much, it's more about social insurance than about redistribution. Okay, so yes, uh, you know, you inherit different levels of wealth and everything, and, and you might want to redistribute that. But I would frame it as a redistribution question. And the inverse Euler equation is much more about, you know, social insurance, meaning, you know, the kind of risk that you're going to be facing uh, uh, during your lifetime. Okay. 
Uh, so these drugs are going to be private information in every period, and so uh, we're going to require allocations to be uh, incentive compatible, and this is uh, how you could write the incentive constraints, and you go uh, quickly over this. Uh, now some notations for the technology. So uh, here I'm this is going to be aggregate consumption in period T. So it's a double aggregate. Okay, so first there's an aggregation over the different types, and then for a given uh, type I, there's an aggregation over all the possible realizations of the, stochastic, of the history of stochastic processes up to period T. Okay? So that's what this, uh, this uh, integral and expectation represents. The same thing for, uh, for labor supply. The resource constraint is going to be as follows. So we're going to generalize what we had in the two-period model and allow for uh, a neoclassical uh, technology I could introduce adjustment costs and uh, a lot of bells and whistles, but uh, let's keep it uh, simple. And uh, the one thing I want to flash is this, uh, this ET that I'm introducing here. Okay, So uh, this ET is going to be the way I'm going to be computing efficiency gains. Basically, I'm going to be uh, starting from an allocation, perturbing this allocation, Okay, deliver the same utility, uh, with the same liberal allocation, preserve incentive compatibility, and saving some resources in every period. Okay? And these resources that I'm saving in every period, ET, are going to be a measure of my efficiency gain. Okay, so that's why I'm introducing them uh, in there. Um, so in that world, uh, which is uh, dynamic now, uh, you can still uh, consider the sets that I was uh, introducing in the two-period model. So this is the set of allocations that deliver utility VI to type I and implement a given labor allocation. Okay. Uh, and so this is the, they have to preserve the labor allocation, satisfy incentive compatibility, and deliver uh, this given utility. And then you have a set of perturbations. Okay. If you have a given allocation, you can perturb it okay, and obtain other allocations. And this proposition says that the two are basically the same thing. Okay? Uh, there are some regularity conditions that, that are needed, but, uh, let me, which are needed in order to uh, apply the, uh, the envelope condition, but let me, let me not go into that. So to, to, to really, to a large extent, uh, these two sets are equivalent as they were uh, in the two-period model. Okay? So we still have this thing, a given labor allocation, uh, a given utility, we have a set of consumption allocation that implements it, and they're all obtainable one from the other using these uh, parallel perturbations. So we're, the only thing we can do is shift around uh, the intertemporal allocation of consumption. So let me uh, tell you how these perturbations work in the, in the dynamic setting. So they work as follows. You can think of uncertainty unfolding uh, along a tree, okay? and there are nodes in this tree. So what you can do is perturb a given node pretending that it's exactly the two-period model I had before. Okay, so you shift utility by beta delta in one period and by delta across all nodes uh, in the next period. And then you can combine those perturbations. You can do it in every period at every node. Okay? So that's how uh, utility is going to be perturbed in this given node. Maybe I do a perturbation here and maybe I inherit a perturbation from the previous period. Okay? And uh, if you sum up uh, the, the utilities that you obtain uh, through this perturbation uh, and you work through the algebra, you realize that as long as you impose that the initial perturbation is zero, then you deliver the same utility. And by construction, you also preserve uh, incentive compatibility. Okay? And what we're going to do is generalize this set okay, to allow for uh, a given initial utility shifter, delta nine. Now, uh, for uh, efficiency, uh, so if you take an allocation, it's going to be, we're going to say that it's feasible if uh, it satisfies incentive compatibility and the resource constraints. I'm going to say that an allocation is efficient if there's no other, other feasible allocation that delivers the same utility to a, every agent, has the same initial capital stock, and saves some resources in some period. So that's a good notion of, uh, of efficiency. 
I'm going to be interested in a, a more a restricted notion, which is going to be conditional efficiency. So I'm going to add the constraint that the labor allocation is constant, okay, is preserved. Okay, so for a given labor allocation, I can look at efficiency. And I define it exactly in the same way. And I'm going to say that an allocation is conditionally efficient uh, if uh, it's uh, efficient among uh, the allocations that have uh, this labor allocation. And now you have this uh, characterization of conditional efficiency, uh, which is uh, two conditions. So the allocation has to be feasible. That is, it has to, has to be incentive compatible. Uh, and uh, it has to be resource feasible. And the only, only other condition is that it has satisfied the inverse Euler equation. Okay. So uh, where QT here is related to the interest rate, and the interest rate is related to the rental rate of to the marginal product of cap. So uh, what you see again here is that. Uh, Free savings is incompatible with this uh, condition, okay, because the Euler equation is incompatible with the inverse Euler equation, and that conditional efficiency is going to require uh, optimal uh, savings distortions, non-zero optimal savings distortions. What you can see also, and that's going to be important to understand the origin of the efficiency in some savings distortions, is that there are really two separate parts to this condition in the environment that I have here. So this condition is saying that the marginal rate of substitution of every agent has to be equal to the marginal rate of transformation. Where the marginal rate of substitution is not the usual marginal rate of substitution, it's the marginal rate of substitution that corresponds to the inverse Euler equation. Okay? So there are two parts to uh, this uh, string of, of equality. The first part emphasizes that the marginal rate of substitution has to be the same for all agents. Okay. The second part emphasizes that this marginal rate of substitution that is common to all agents has to be equal to the marginal rate of transformation. And this observation is going to be at the, at the source of a decomposition of uh, the efficiency gains from capital taxation that we're going to provide. First, you need to align everybody's uh, marginal rate of substitution. And second, you need to make sure that this marginal rate of substitution is the same as the marginal rate of transformation. Put it differently. Imagine that you freeze the aggregate consumption allocation. Okay. Then uh, I cannot make sure that the marginal rate of substitution is equal to the marginal rate of transformation, but there might still be efficiency gains from moving from using those perturbations to make sure that everybody's marginal rate of transformation is equalized, marginal rate of substitution is equalized. So if I start from an allocation that satisfies the Euler equation. And I say, OK, I don't want to sh uh, shift consumption, aggregate consumption over time. There are still going to be efficiency gains uh, from uh, respecting this prescription. Okay? And then there are going to be further efficiency gains from perturbing the aggregate allocation of consumption to make sure that this is equal to this. Can I just add that um, a good way to describe the inverse That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. You're going to see actually that this analogy is going to be uh, featured in some of the way we're going to solve this. So it's going to look very much like uh, what people in macro call an income. I mean, the method is going to look like uh, you have an income fluctuation problem where the budget is exactly what you're describing. So the savings decisions are in terms of utility. It's not quite that simple, but, but I mean, the first part, I, I think you were right. Now, I want to emphasize also that don't, here I'm not talking about implementations, OK? So, uh, but there are implementations where agents face actual budget constraints and you know, decide to make those optimal choices given the budget constraints that you give them. OK, now, it's a separate question that's interesting. All right. I have how much time? 25 minutes. 25 minutes. Okay. 
All right, so I need one normalization in order to report a number for efficiency gain. Uh, and this normalization is going to be the following. So imagine you start from a feasible allocation. Okay. And this feasible allocation is not saving any resources. The ET is equal to zero in every period. So it just satisfies the resource constraint. But it's not conditionally efficient. So I can find uh, an improvement by using those uh, perturbations. Okay. And I can save some resources in every period. Now I'm going to try to specialize to, I'm going to impose that you save this amount of resources in every period, something that's proportional to the initial consumption allocation. And I'm going to report lambda tilde as my measure of efficiency gain. Okay. So you have two frontiers. It's always a bit arbitrary the way you're going to compute the distance between those two frontiers. And this is uh, a, a, you know, a meaningful way of computing that distance. There are other ways to do it. Uh, but that's consistent with the, the way people do uh, welfare in general, uh, in the way, for example, Lucas reported his, uh, his welfare numbers. So that's it. Now we're in business. Uh, we have our method, and we can build our little machine and try to, uh, and we have a, a simple planning problem. Ah. Okay. So uh, the planning problem is you start from a given allocation, okay, that's feasible, and uh, you try to perturb it. Uh, so U tilde has to be in the set of perturbed allocations from the initial allocations. So you, the only thing you can do is these parallel perturbations. You have to have the, the same initial capital stock. And uh, in every period, you have to save an amount of resources that's proportional to the initial consumption allocation. And lambda tilde, which is what you're trying to maximize, is the measure of efficiency gain. I'm sorry? No, no, no. I, I, it's just you have, you have a, an allocation that's not efficient. Okay? Then you have a, a frontier of allocations that are efficient. The question is how you compute the distance. And I'm just proposing a way to compute the distance. That's my normalization. That's the way I choose to compute the distance between the two curves. Because I want to report one number. Uh, otherwise, I could do something different. Uh, no, certainly not. This is like anybody who reports a welfare number is subject to this criticism. You know? There are just many ways to go from one curve to, a, to compute the distance between one curve and another. No, it's the standard way of doing it. Uh, but the but isn't, again, isn't there a risk that... No, for sure. I mean, ideally, yeah. you would... Uh, so, so you could look... I can plot the two curves. What you could do is to look at, a, at, a, at another way of doing it. For example, you could, sure. you could look at maximizing the, the gain in, in one period. Yeah. Uh, and, and compare yeah, yeah. that. Sure. Simple computation. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I'm not trying to, you know, this is a number that's reasonable. You have to know what it corresponds to. It's not a sacred or a golden number. It's calculated in a particular way. And it happens to be a way that's consistent with most of the welfare calculations that are done in the literature. So, but it, it's a bit artificial to report one number. That's just the nature of the exercise that we're doing. Uh, you have two curves, and you have to compute the distance between the two curves. And we're choosing to compute the distance this way. It squares with what people do usually, but it, it's certainly not. I mean, all those things are not simple transformations one of the other. So you, you know, there's an element of arbitrariness here. Yeah, exactly. So because this set is the set of perturbations of the initial allocation. So I, I don't mean to say that it's not an interesting question to, to go to other, other welfare measures. But you have to realize that this is something that's present in any uh, welfare calculation where you report a number. But I don't, here I have a concave technology. So a net present value is not such an easy thing to do. When I have, if I had a linear technology, then you know you would say, okay, I'm going to do a report just the, 
the percentage reduction in cost, for example. That would be a measure that you would accept just like that. And it happens to coincide uh, in the case where this technology is linear. OK? All right. So, uh, so that's our problem. And uh, you know, it's going to be feasible, but it's still going to be hard. And the reason for that is that we have to solve for, you know, there's a whole distribution to solve for here. Okay? You have uh, all this tree of uncertainty, and you have to do all these perturbations uh, at, every, uh, point, uh, at every point in the tree. So you have a very high dimensional object that evolves over time. So it's not easy to, it's not a, an easy problem to solve, and you have to, to clear the resource constraint. So we're going to find a way to do it uh, by breaking it down uh, in two pieces. The first one is going to be a component planning problem, uh, which is going to be manageable. And the other one is going to be an aggregate planning problem. So let me try to go there. What's the commensuration? Ah, uh, yeah. So uh, not only do you have at the optimal distribution, uh, not only does it evolve over time, as you can imagine, but it evolves in a particular way uh, that it becomes degenerate. Uh, so this is a, a result that's called immiseration. So basically all the resources of the economy become concentrated in the hands of a vanishing fraction of the population. And everybody else is converging to uh, uh, zero consumption. Okay. Uh, it's a feature of the optimum here. Okay. And that's something that uh, goes back to Atkinson and Lucas. I think they were the first ones to, uh, to emphasize it. And it's going to be true in this model as well. Okay. I, we could have a whole debate about that. It's interesting. It, it was a very paradoxical result. You know, they wrote down a model where you care about inequality, and you get this result that, in the long run, you get this very extreme outcome. So they're a bit supply sider, so they view it. Uh, uh, they viewed it a bit as a, you know, saying like, look, even if you care about inequality, it might be optimal to tolerate a lot of uh, inequality. Uh, but I don't want to go into that right now. Okay. Uh, so now I want to compute these efficiency gains. And the way I'm going to do it is, uh, so I'm going to put, uh, the problem really is that you have all these problems for all these different types, and they're linked together with the, with the resource constraints. So a standard trick to deal with those problems is to uh, put Lagrange multipliers on those constraints. Okay? And then you can separate them and study component planning problems. So this is what I'm doing here. So instead of having the, budget, the, the feasibility constraint in every period, I'm just, uh, I'm just putting Lagrange multipliers uh, on this thing, OK? And then I can break it down in two pieces. There's going to be a problem. If I have the Q tildes, OK, the Lagrange multipliers and the resource constraints, then there's a problem for the aggregates. And that looks very much like, you know, the neoclassical uh, a transition in the neoclassical, uh, in the, in the, the neoclassical growth model. And then there's a subproblem for every uh, u tilde i, for every uh, type, that's going to look like this. Okay? And this one, I'm going to be able to break it into one subproblem for each uh, u tilde i. Okay? Because it's, uh, you can see that it's just linear. Okay? So basically, the algorithm is as follows. Okay? Uh, you start with some q tildes. Okay? You get a component planning problem for a given type. And this component player problem is going to have a recursive representation uh, that is going to have a low dimensional state space. So it's something that we're going to be able to study even numerically. Okay. Then from the aggregate resource constraint, you have the perturbed allocation now, and you can build lambda tilde and k tilde. Okay. Then uh, what you can do is compute a new sequence of q tildes, because uh, the q tildes have to be related to the maximal product of capital. Okay. And you iterate until you find the fixed point. So uh, that's our algorithm for uh, solving the problem. Now, uh, I should speed up a bit. Um, there's a particular class of baseline allocations that we're going to be interested in. And uh, it's going to be described as follows. So um, theta is going to be a Markov process, so uncertainty. And you're gonna, we're going to be able to represent the utility of the baseline after a given history i as a function of uh, a state vector, sti. And the state vector is going to be composed of the realization of the shock today and an endogenous state variable, xti. 
So think, for example, about an income fluctuation problem. So agents are going to face income shocks in every period. So that's the theta. And they're going to try to, and they, can, they have access to savings technology. So they can build a buffer stock of assets to try to, that they can draw on uh, when they get bad shocks. So you can represent the state space for an individual by uh, the Markov process for the shock and the level of savings that they have. Okay? So we would be able to describe the allocation that would correspond to this problem with this state space. So this XDI is endogenous from the perspective of the agent in the original model that we're solving, but we're going to be taking it as exogenous. That's our baseline allocation. The bottom line is that we can describe it like this, and there's going to be some law of motion for what we call the endogenous state. Uh, so savings is going to be, uh, this is just the policy function for, for uh, savings. Okay. So we're going to be uh, imagining that we have something that we call the recursive baseline like this. And you're going to see how uh, it's going to lead to a low-dimensional Bellman equation for the component planning problem. And there we're going to see the feature that Ilya anticipated, which is that this Bellman equation is going to look very much like a savings problem, but where the savings is in terms of utility and not in terms of consumption. Okay. And actually, utility is exactly like the income shock in an income fluctuation problem. And the savings in terms of utility is like the savings in an income fluctuation problem. So this is a very simple Bellman equation. Okay? Del and, and S is, that is the state that represents the original baseline allocation, is our forcing process. Okay? Tau is just time. And delta, okay, which is these perturbations that I'm doing over time, has the interpretation that it's the savings uh, in this new model. So the bottom line is that you see that it's a Bellman equation, which is one-dimensional in terms of endogenous state variable. Okay. So that's a problem that's numerically very tractable, that we know very well because it looks very much like an income fluctuation problem. Okay. Uh, so that's something that's going to be easy to solve. And it gives you an idea a bit of why our method uh, is going to be tractable. That's the core of it, really. Now, uh, in the log case, I'm going to be able to uh, perform a decomposition that, uh, that is useful. And this decomposition I alluded to already. So I'm going to be able to split uh, the efficiency gains from optimal savings distortions into two parts, an idiosyncratic part and an aggregate part. The idiosyncratic part okay, is going to say you have to uh, not upset the original, the, the amount of consumption that's being done in every period. Okay. So I am imposing the constraint that aggregate consumption is, has to be constant, the same as, the, as in the original baseline. Okay. So, uh, and the, the corresponding gains, I'm going to call the idiosyncratic gains. And they're going to come from equalizing the marginal rate of substitutions corresponding to the inverse order equation across individuals. And the aggregate gains are going to be coming from equalizing those marginal rate of substitution to the marginal rate of transformation. Okay. And you can see that that part takes as an input the idiosyncratic uh, efficiency gains and otherwise looks very much like a transition in the neoclassical growth model. Okay. So that part uh, you can do in closed form because you have some concavity in the production function f, but it's something that we know very well and that can be computed very easily. And this, we're going to be able to apply um, our Bellman equation to. Okay. So uh, there are really two sources of the gains. These uh, idiosyncratic gains that make sure that marginal rates of substitution are equalized across agents. And then these aggregate gains that make sure that these marginal rates of substitutions are equal to the marginal rate of, of uh, transformation. So let me uh, do the first numerical example. One approach is to say, all right, Let's take the, our model a bit seriously. Uh, the only thing we need to know is the consumption allocation. We happen to have some knowledge of consumption allocations in the data and the amount of risk that's in those consumption allocations. And uh, not a bad description would be a geometric random walk. Okay? So uh, assume that the baseline allocation has consumption uh, being a geometric random walk, and the innovations are IID and log norm. And uh, we're assuming that originally we're at a steady state. Okay? And that's going to imply, uh, and imagine also that there are no capital taxes. So uh, from the Euler equation, 
uh, we know that the interest rate is going to be related to uh, the amount of uh, risk in the consumption process. So that's just precautionary savings. So the higher is sigma square epsilon, the more risk there is in consumption, the lower is going to be the interest rate because people are going to be accumulating uh, more savings. Okay. Now, uh, in this model, uh, the idiosyncratic gains are going to be equal to zero. Why? Because the marginal rate of substitution corresponding to the inverse Euler equation are all equalized already. Okay. So it's a feature of the geometric random walk with the constant variance. So there are no idiosyncratic gains, and all the gains are going to be aggregates. Yeah. Higher idiosyncratic risk because people engage in precautionary savings, so they accumulate more capital. And if you have more capital, because you have a new classical uh, production function, you have a lower interest rate. That's a very well-known feature dating back to Ayagari. Okay. All right. Now, I'm first going to I'm going to do two sets of calculations. The first one in partial equilibrium. And by that I mean with the linear savings technology, and the second one with the concave neoclassical technology. So, with the linear technology, what you do is that you superimpose a, a downward trend on the original allocation. So this is how the, uh, the perturbed allocation is obtained from the original allocation. Okay. So this is the original allocation. It fluctuates. And you superimpose a trend like this. So you consume more initially and less uh, eventually. So you decumulate uh, capital over time. Okay. And uh, this trend okay, that you superimpose is exactly commensurate with uh, the variance of uh, consumption growth. So it's really you're trying to undo the precautionary savings of agents. Actually, the temporal wedge is also related to that. And then you can compute the efficiency gained uh, in closed form in this case, and you see that they scale up with the variance of consumption growth. Okay. And you have a, a formula that actually allows you to relate those gains to, uh, to the intertemporal wedge. So it's a, the usual formula. The gains are uh, in the squared uh, of two. So uh, when we do general equilibrium, then uh, what happens is that uh, you still have this motive that basically you want to do those perturbations, okay? And you want to decumulate capital. But as you decumulate capital, the return, of capital, the return on, on capital increases. So it becomes less and less tempting to do these decumulations, okay? So eventually you stop and you converge to a new steady state uh, with uh, a higher interest rate because it has less capital. And, uh, and the transition is very easy to compute. So here we try to, these are some, some studies that try to uh, quantify the amount of consumption risk. And uh, what we do is that we compute the efficiency gains for the whole range of empirical estimates that are out there. So this is our version of the range of empirical estimates for sigma square epsilon. And this is the efficiency gains. This is for the linear or savings technology. This is for the concave savings technology, the neoclassical production function. Uh, and the three curves correspond to three different values of the discount factor. Because what really matters is the amount of uncertainty per unit of discounting. So uh, it depends on beta in a very predictable way. But so what you see is that in partial equilibrium, first, the range is very large. Okay? And it goes up to something like 10%. So these are very large welfare gains. Okay? Uh, but it can also be very small. And uh, you can also see that when you move from partial equilibrium to general equilibrium, these gains are drastically mitigated. Okay? So the maximum you can get in this general equilibrium calculation is 0.25%. Uh, is okay? So much, much smaller. And it's because of what I told you. So there's this motive to uh, decumulate capital, to undo uh, precautionary savings, to do these perturbations in reverse. The reason for that is that uh, basically, those perturbations is like an asset. Uh, imagine I can, I have an asset where I can uh, reduce consumption today and uh, reduce utility today and increase utility in a parallel way across all nodes tomorrow. Okay. Think about what that means in terms of consumption. It's an asset because it increases utility by a given amount in all, the, in all nodes tomorrow. It's an asset that has to pay out more when consumption is high 
because marginal utility of consumption is decreasing. So to generate a given increase in utility, I need to increase consumption more if consumption is high. Okay? So it's an asset that has bad hedging properties. So you want to go short. Okay? So you want to borrow with this asset. And it's something that basically allows you to borrow today more against the good state of the world tomorrow than against the bad states of the world. That's why it's an attractive perturbation today. So you want to do some of it. And in partial equilibrium, actually, this motive to decumulate capital is, is constant through time. When you have a, a concave production function, then uh, you have this other force that as you decumulate capital, the return on capital increases. So you want to do it less and less. And this happens to be for you know, the kind of decreasing returns to capital that we think are there in the data, a very powerful force in terms of mitigating how much you want to do it and mitigating the, the associated welfare gain. Uh, okay, so that's a lesson. The welfare gains depend a lot on the variance of consumption growth and the degree of decreasing returns to scale. Yeah. So, so, I mean, actually, it's very related to the, so Lucas wrote a very famous paper which was called Some Supply Side Economics. And the exercise that he did is he started, he took the neoclassical growth model with some capital taxes. And he said, I'm going to remove those capital taxes and see what the welfare gains are. So he found two things. The first thing is that uh, as he removed the capital taxes in the long run, you accumulate a lot more capital. So it's very sensitive. The long run uh, elasticity of capital is very high in that model. Actually, it's infinite. But he also found that if you take into account the transition, the welfare gains are actually quite small. Okay, so the message of that paper is somehow some, sometimes a bit, uh, a bit lost. So we find something a bit similar. Okay. There's a big movement in capital. That's right. First, we go in the opposite direction. Second, there might be a big movement in, uh, in capital, but uh, the associated welfare gains are, are not that large. Okay. So it's quite consistent. OK, so that's, uh, that's one approach where we take, uh, uh, we take a baseline consumption allocation to be a geometric random walk. To be honest, we don't have uh, all those studies are good, but they're not very good. Okay, so we don't really, as you can see, the range of estimates is quite large. There's, there's a lot of uncertainty. We're not sure a geometric random walk is really such a good approximation and everything. So we have much better knowledge of income and income risk. So an alternative is to say, all right, I'm going to take as my primitives an income process, and I'm going to use a standard model to try to understand what consumption process would be associated with this income process under our current policy. And I'm going to take that as my baseline and perform the same exercise. So that's what we do here. Okay? So uh, I have to fast forward a little bit. So we take, you know, uh, it's an Iagari model, so basically people face income risk like this, and it's a generalization of a geometric random walk what they're facing. There's some in reversion uh, in the process, okay? uh, this parameter row. And then uh, what they can do is uh, accumulate more or less assets, so, uh, and they, they're facing borrowing constraints. So it's really an income fluctuation problem. They engage in precautionary savings. Uh, and that's what you find here, so I'm just showing you, for example, this is the original aggregate consumption allocation. The wiggles are just due to the fact that our numerical method is not perfect. It should be a straight line. Okay? And this is the optimal aggregate consumption allocation. Okay? So you see that you start by consuming, consuming more, you decumulate capital as you do that, okay? and eventually you consume less, you stabilize. So it's the same kind of dynamics that we anticipated from the geometry of random wall case. This is a particular path. And you see that uh, uh, the trend is uh, featured there. And these are our numbers for, for welfare. So we cover, uh, we try to cover also the range of existing, the range of reasonable estimates for, uh, for income risk. Uh, and this thing that I'm flashing is uh, what Iagari thought at the time was his preferred calibration. There's a big, there's a bit of debate as to how much risk there is really. I don't want to go into that. We, you can see it as a, an exploration uh, of what the, the efficiency gains depend on, and this would not be a bad case. So here we have uh, the effect on the interest rate 
from the original allocation to the optimal allocation, you see that the, uh, the interest rate is always higher at the steady state of the optimal allocation if you accumulate capital. And this is a decomposition of the total efficiency gains between idiosyncratic gains and aggregate gains. Okay, and you remember uh, what uh, those come from. And what do you see here? Uh, you see that first, uh, the gains are not that large. Okay. If I increase risk aversion, okay, they become a little bigger, especially if I go for a lot more risk. Uh, and here they can be really quite large, actually. Okay. You can go to 8.4%. Okay. Uh, this would be a, an unreasonable amount of risk, but I mean, potentially, you, know, you can get something very large out of it if you put enough risk. Uh, I'll go, I'm going to qualify this in a minute. The second lesson is that most of the gains, uh, if you look at it, are uh, idiosyncratic. Okay, the aggregate gains are uh, contribute almost uh, zero to this. Okay, uh, so this is summarizing this. Most of the gains are idiosyncratic. They are increasing with the coefficient of relative risk aversion, increasing with the standard deviation and persistence of shock. The gains have a large range. For Iagari's preferred calibrations, the gains are quite moderate. But now, remember, I showed you some very large numbers, 8.4%. Okay, and it's a bit implausible, the amount of risk that is there. And it's kind of high risk aversion, 5. But it still, you know, it still uh, raises the question. So here we want to go a bit further and, and ask whether we've really, uh, we've really isolated the gains from savings distortions. Remember here, we're starting from a model that has borrowing constraints. That means that even at the baseline allocation, the Euler equation is not going to be verified. So when people are borrowing constraint, then uh, uh, they're borrowing constraints. So the Euler equation doesn't hold. Okay. So the perturbations that we're introducing are not only introducing savings distortions. Okay. They're first undoing the borrowing constraints and then introducing saving distortions on top of that. And it's a bit unfair to uh, load all of the efficiency gains on the savings distortions. So we want to have a way of separating the gains that are coming from undoing the borrowing constraints and the gains that are coming from imposing savings distortions. In other words, we want to know where are the gains from moving from the original allocation to the allocation that satisfies the Euler equation, and then the gains from the allocation that satisfies the Euler equation to the one that satisfies the inverse Euler equation. And our result, uh, I won't show you the tables, but you can, you can trust me, is that most of the gains comes from relaxing the borrowing constraints. Okay. So it's really coming, so this 8.4%, for example, you see that 6.3% of it comes from relaxing the borrowing constraints and not from uh, imposing optimal savings distortions. Okay, so uh, I'm going to wrap up here.